welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome the 57th governor of the state of Missouri, Michael L. Parson, to the dais. I thought maybe a speaker was going to do this. Oh, okay. All right. Well, first of all, thank you, Lieutenant Governor, uh, Mr. Speaker, statewide officials, members of the General Assembly, esteemed guests, and it is my honor to welcome, for the first time in our state's history, judges of the first ever female majority Supreme Court of Missouri. There's another uh, person I want to recognize today that uh, I normally don't do it, but I'm going to do it very quickly. It is a gentleman that has been doing this job for 20 years, making sure these teleprompters work correctly. Todd Mayfield is doing his 20th session here in the state of Missouri. Todd, thank you. Well, to say the least, it's an honor to be joined by the First Lady as I welcome, as I welcome to the dais for the final time as the 57th governor of the great state of Missouri. During our time as governor, we've accomplished more than any of us probably thought was ever possible. But I wouldn't be standing here today without my support system, my family. And that's where I want to start today. First and foremost, the First Lady. Teresa has been by my side every step of the way, and after 38 years of marriage, I wouldn't be the husband, the father, the gramps, or governor I am today without her. Thank you for serving in a role you never asked for, but doing it each and every day with grace and passionate commitment to best serve the people of Missouri. Ladies and gentlemen, the First Lady of the State of Missouri. Now there's another group of people with me today, and it's my family. And uh, I am one of the most blessed people in the world to have the family I have and for all of them to be here. And it really started with my son and my daughter years ago that really made me a better person, having those two come in my life. And they're both here today with us. Uh, naturally, they're the ones that have all my grandkids. And uh, I, I just can't say enough of how much my children's meant to me in my life and my grandkids. And most of them are here today, but I do have one I want to give a little bit of a shout out to. It is his first public event at the ripe age of six months. So he is with us here today for the first time. And then also I have another grand, great grandchild on the way that's here. My brothers are here. I have nieces and nephews and cousins, brothers, all my family from here. But I tell you, there's two things I know in life that, that are important. That's God Almighty and my family. I love all you guys that are here today. Would you please recognize my family for, and show them your appreciation? Please rise. Like the legislators in this room and Missourians across this state, 
my faith, family, and the next generations are the driving force behind the change we have made in Missouri. And last year, when I stood before you, I highlighted many of our historic achievements we've accomplished together. As we laid out bold and historic proposals, I declared that this governor, this dad, this Gramps is not done yet. And I tell you, we are not done yet. And while that's still true, I'm here to tell you we're getting close. After serving six sessions in the House, six sessions in the Senate, two sessions as Lieutenant Governor, and now my sixth and final session as your 57th governor, I am expected to say this is a bittersweet moment. But while the view from this dais facing all of you is a fine sight to see, but it is no comparison to the view of that Polk County farm behind the windshield of my John Deere tractor. But look, I promise I will think of all of you occasionally. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I'll be leaving here with my head held high. Because like many of you who came here for the right reasons, we never wavered from those wise words on our capital and inscribed in our state seal. Let the good of the people be the supreme law. In every decision we make, we must look to the effects on the next generations and the ability for them to achieve their American dream. In every decision, we must put people first. Easy said, but hard to do. It's a simple idea that has been our guiding principle since the very beginning. And that's our final commitment to you. Until our final day, we will continue to put people first. When I became governor, Missouri was tired of the turmoil, political infighting, and self-involved personalities. They were tired of quitters. And when I first stepped into the governor's office, amidst the thousands of camera clicks, hundreds of shouting questions, and countless state, local, and national media, we closed the chapter on scandal and began a new direction because there was no turning back. We declared a fresh start and the return of stability. We committed to ensuring the next generations have their opportunity at the American dream. We promised the return of integrity to state government. And above all, we promised to return people first mentality. And today, I firmly believe we have done just that. Every year, we have approved conservative and balanced budgets. We have maintained our AAA credit rating, and we've always left funds on the bottom line. Actually, with the budget we outlined today, we will leave office with over $1.5 billion on the bottom line, which has never been done before in our state's history. We are also pleased to report that we have paid down Missouri's debt by over $600 million, leaving the state with 53% less debt than when we started. That is quite the contrast compared to what we are seeing happening in Washington, D.C. In Missouri, we don't leave future generations to pick up the tab. We pay our bills and we put people first. <laughs> we
Working with all of you, balanced and conservative budgets have always been the norm, never the exception. And we've always been more interested in giving back Missourians hard-earned dollars rather than spending them. In turn, that creates jobs, business growth, and increased revenues to the state. In fact, state revenues have increased 40% since 2018, with a significant growth coming from sales revenue, not income tax, not corporate tax, and not fuel taxes, but from revenue created by Missourians spending their own money, not government programs. And one of the huge factors is the three separate tax cuts we approved, including the largest in our state's history. We have decreased Missourians' tax burdens by over 20%, unleashing an economic powerhouse in the state of Missouri. When I became governor, we were ranked 42nd for GDP growth and last among our Midwest neighbors. Today, we are ranked 23rd in the nation and top five in the Midwest for GDP growth. That's a real reckoning here in Jeff City. That's not all talk and all hot air. That is a true reckoning of growth opportunity that Missourians have come to expect from this administration and state government. That's our leadership creating a real formula for success. And that's something all of us should celebrate in this chamber. Overall, Missouri now has the 13th lowest tax burden of any state in the nation. And under our administration, our unemployment rate fell to 2.1%, the lowest rate ever recorded in our state's history. Actually, it has been so low that our problem is not creating jobs, but filling jobs. Since becoming governor, we have added more than 110,000 jobs to our economy and closed out the year ranked 15th nationally for job creations. And today, as I stand before you for the final time as Missouri's 57th governor, I declare that the state of our state is stronger than it has ever been. We've done it all by putting people first. And that started with state government. Nothing we do in this room is possible without the dedicated public servants across the state to implement these ideas. But when I became governor, state government was quickly becoming underappreciated, understaffed, and underpaid. That's why we approved three historic pay increases to recruit and retain quality talent across state government. Raising team member pay by over 20% since 2018 and let me just say, the investment in our state employees have been worth every penny. <laughs> and that's why this year, we are proposing an additional 3.2% cost of living increase for all of our state employees. <laughs> and representing our more than 47,000 state team members here today, is my cabinet. Through every crisis, I turn to my cabinet and their teams 
not the federal government. And I have always maintained that the answers to our problems are in this state and among our people. If we just allow ourselves to put egos and self-importance to the side and just listen, and while they may have already been recognized, I want to ask my cabinet to stand with me for one last time. I always say that being a good leader is not about being the best, but it's making those around you better. And today, I thank you and your teams for proving that to be true. Putting people first is something we implemented across state government because we set the example from the governor's office. From the start, we got straight to work. We completed the largest deregulation effort in our state's history, eliminating nearly one out of every five state regulations. And during COVID-19, we waived over 600 more regulations. By working with the General Assembly, we made many of these changes permanent in statute and improved the regulatory environment in Missouri. Because to be honest with you, many of these rules and laws should have never existed in the first place. When I became governor, we also inherited nearly 4,000 pending clemency applications. While I'm a law and order governor, 4,000 people in limbo waiting for an answer is not how we do good business. Whether we approved them or we denied, we set out to provide answers. Today, I am proud to announce that the clemency backlog we inherited has been totally cleared for the first time in decades. <laughs> but as a former sheriff, this reform did not mean we were letting people out of prison or forgiving violent criminals. We pardoned people who deserved it people who had truly turned their lives around, people like Kenny Batson, who joins us here today. In his youth, Kenny was drinking, getting into fights, and found himself on the wrong side of the law. But today, Kenny has turned his life completely around. Kenny is a proud husband and father of three kids. He earned both a bachelor's and master's degree and has been a pastor for more than 20 years, including service as a hospice chaplain. Kenny's and others like him might have made some mistakes when they were young, but he earned a second chance. Please join me in recognizing Kenny Batson. Another way our office has been able to capitalize on historic opportunity is appointing over 155 Missouri judges and three Supreme Court judges, meaning more than 40% of the judiciary has been appointed by our administration. That's more appointments than any governor in our state's history. By focusing on core conservative values, We've truly reshaped judiciary for generations to come and guaranteed a judiciary that upholds the law and not the politics of the moment. <clears throat> A 
Additionally, in putting the people of Missouri first, our office put politics aside and appointed five strong statewide office holders, which has never happened before in our state's history. Lieutenant Governor Kehoe, Attorney General Bailey, Auditor Fitzpatrick, Treasurer Malik, and though he's not here today, Senator Smith. And I thank all of you for stepping up and answering the call to serve Missourians, and I trust you will never quit on the people of the great state of Missouri. And today, I want to highlight another one of our quality appointments. In the city of St. Louis, Circuit Attorney Gabe Gore. We didn't pick Mr. Gore because of his politics. Matter of fact, we never even asked. It was because he clearly cared for the people of St. Louis. He valued strong communities, fighting time, fighting crime, returning law and order, and putting people first. The level of professionalism between the circuit attorney's office, the Metro Police, the courts, the attorney general's office, and our office is greater than I have ever experienced. Please join me in recognizing St. Louis circuit attorney, Gabe Gore. When the history books tell the story of Missouri's 57th governor, I hope it's our workforce development infrastructure accomplishments that stand out. And this year, as we propose our final priorities as governor, there is no turning back. We know that guaranteeing Missouri's strong foundation starts with a quality education in our children. This year, we will once again fully fund the K through 12 foundation formula with an additional $120 million over last year's level. And we will also fully fund transportation across the state of Missouri. In total, our administration has increased funding for K through 12 education by $700 million since 2018. And I'll note that's all state funding, not the federal government. And at the same time, our administration and this General Assembly took the first step towards school choice for more Missouri families through our education savings account program. And whether it's public, private, charter, or Christian, we don't care where Missourians are getting a quality education as long as they get one. This year, to do our part on teacher pay. We are including funding to increase teacher pay baseline, increase teacher baseline pay to $40,000 per year. This represents a $15,000 increase for teacher pay during our administration. We are also recommending $6 million for Career Ladder. Together, these programs have benefited tens of thousands of teachers in every corner across our state. We've also made historic investments in Missouri's higher education. We've increased higher education core funding by 24%. And invested 
$1.2 billion in state-of-the-art capital improvements and upgrades on our college campuses. In this year's budget, we included another 3% core increase for our four-year institutions and community colleges and $54 million from MoExcel's workforce training program on our college campuses. When I graduated high school, I went straight into the workforce and joined the United States Army. And for me, there was no turning back. My path is similar to many Missourians, as nearly 60% of our workforce don't have college degrees. And that's okay, because we all know it doesn't take a college education to be successful. Since 2018, we have helped establish, upgrade, and transform 57 career and technical education institutions across our state. More of our young people are earning a quality skill, a certificate, or credential that will help secure them a big, a good paying job without a college degree. We are also upskilling our current workforce and helping them secure the skills they need to succeed. Since its upgrade in 2019, Missouri One Start has helped train more than 173,000 workers. Additionally, since its creation, our Fast Track program has benefited over 1,700 students with more than 55% going into health care. And ladies, I want you to listen up. And more than two thirds of that being women. <laughs> we have also made tremendous progress by prioritizing apprenticeships in this state. And joining us today are some of the individuals who have benefited from our historic support. In the upper gallery, we have Isaac Lowe from Four Rivers Career Center, Kayla Putnam, an apprenticeship and Army Reservist from Springfield, and Ricky Schmo, who is a trucking apprenticeship from Pleasant Hill. I firmly believe that with hard work, determination, and a skill of some kind, anyone can achieve the American dream, and these individuals are proving it. Please join me in recognizing these hardworking folks and others like them across the state. <laughs> this group represents just a sample of the more than 57,000 new apprenticeships we have added since becoming governor. Under our administration, yearly apprenticeship activity in Missouri has grown by 100%. That's why this year, we're including another $3 million investment to support even more youth apprenticeship opportunities. As you can see, these targeted investments truly make a difference in the lives of Missourians. And thanks to our past efforts, I'm proud to report that Missouri is ranked second in the United States of America for apprenticeship, and that's something we should all be proud of. Like any challenge in this state, we rise to it. We don't hide from it. This year, we are also investing another $10 million for advanced semiconductor research, development, and skills training, as well as nearly $7 million to support critical mineral development in Missouri. 
Missouri ranks fourth in the nation for new manufacturing when it comes to semiconductors and critical minerals. We can lead, and we will lead, to ensure we never have to rely on nations like China again. Another focus in the workforce development arena that the First Lady and I are especially proud of is JAG Missouri. JAG includes students who may be struggling academically, who may have found themselves in some trouble, or are high risk. When we first began JAG initiative back in our Lieutenant Governor days, JAG was supporting just six programs and serving 225 students. Today, JAG Missouri supports 112 programs and serves more than 4,000 Missouri students with a high school graduation rate of 98%. And that's thanks in large part to the First Lady for taking this program under her wing. In the upper gallery, we have current and former JAG students joining us today. Thanks to JAG, these students are well on their way, whether that's college, the military, or straight into the workforce. And with your help, we can support this life-changing program with an investment of $3.8 million. But if you choose not to stand behind these students in the upper gallery and the thousands like them across the state, it won't be me you have to answer to, but the first lady herself. <laughs> Would you please join me in giving these JAG students and specialists here with us today a round of applause. When it comes to preparing Missourians for the workforce, we know we are on solid ground. The biggest thing we can do is simply continue. But today, our state is in a critical need of quality early learning programs. Business leaders estimate that the lack of early learning programs is costing our state over $1 billion annually. And over 85% of Missourians believe Early childhood learning supports a child's success, parent success, and a business success. But today, we only have the capacity to serve just 39% of Missouri's children in licensed facilities, and it's time for change. This year, along Senator Arthur and Representative Shields, we're again proposing three new child care tax credit programs these programs will help improve access and affordability for families seeking child care across the state of Missouri. Additionally, we're we are continuing funding for the expansion of pre-kindergarten programs. These are common sense measures that are good for business, that are great for families, and best for our Missouri children. Joining us today, Catherine Gaudier and her child, Theo, who utilize Missouri's child care subsidies. Yet Catherine still finds it difficult to find quality child care. Catherine is a full-time nursing student that uses Mental Areas College's early learning program. Without help, she's not sure she could afford or find care for Theo. Catherine only wants the best possible education for Theo. Something I think we can all agree on. And that should be the minimum for every child in Missouri. That's why this year we are proposing a $52 million investment in Missouri's child care subsidy program 
to make sure infants, toddlers, and children like Theo can receive the quality care they need and deserve. Please join me in welcome Catherine, Theo, and Program Director Jennifer Sykes from Mineral Era College. Another issue affecting Missouri children is the fentanyl crisis. Drugs pouring into our country through the southern border is devastating Missouri families. Last year, dozens of Missouri children were lost due to fentanyl exposure. And I'm going to say that one more time. They were lost to fentanyl exposure. They didn't use it. They didn't do anything. They were just exposed to it, and they lost their lives. This year, alongside Senator Thompson Rader and Representative Parker, we are proposing legislation that guarantees stricter punishments for exposing children and minors to fentanyl. The fentanyl crisis is here, and it's tearing families and communities apart. Children dying from fentanyl is 100% preventable. And while President Biden and the federal government fail to do their jobs by securing our southern border, Missouri will act. We are also protecting Missouri children and our most vulnerable by supporting Attorney General Andrew Bailey's plan to find, prosecute, and punish human traffickers in the state of Missouri. Together, these initiatives are not only pro-children and pro-family, but pro-life as well. And speaking of pro-life, I want to take this opportunity to highlight our historic success in Missouri's fight for life. When I came to Jefferson City, nearly 8,000 elective abortions were performed annually in Missouri. And as I stand before you today, I am proud to report that number is zero. Now another priority of this administration, roads, bridges, and Missouri's infrastructure. While roads and bridge repair might not be the most exciting topic, it is the one that impacts all Missourians the most. Infrastructure was one of the first major initiatives we took on. And five and a half years ago, working with all of you we set out to repair and replace 250 Missouri's porous bridges. For the first time in our state's history, we leveraged general revenue and bonding authority to fund our Focus on Bridges program. The way in which we created this program allowed us to pull down additional funds to not only repair 250 overlooked and crumbling Missouri bridges, but it freed up additional resources for major projects like the Buck O'Neill Bridge, the I-270 North, and the new Roachport Bridge. Many doubted it would ever happen, 
But as I stand before you today, I say mission accomplished. Focus on bridges is complete. I-270 I finished. And by this time next year, we fully expect Roachport and Buck O'Neill to be completed as promised. We truly believe that our focus on bridge program will be the model moving forward. Because although focus was in the name, it doesn't mean everything else stopped. In total, under our administration, we have repaired or replaced over 1,000 bridges across our state. We have repaired nearly 17,000 miles of Missouri roadway in five short years. That's about 50% of all Missouri's entire highway system that has been replaced or repaired. And I'll remind you, we have the seventh largest system in the nation. And as for rural Missouri, with an unprecedented funding of $200 million, nearly 2,000 miles of letters roads have been completed. When I became governor, our statewide transportation improvement program for infrastructure projects across the entire state stood at $2.5 billion. Today, our STIP is funded at nearly $14 billion. And joining us today in the upper gallery are the men and women who are making it all happen. Each of these eight men and women represent over 130 years of experience and the more than 4,600 MoDOT employees across our state. Under our administration, we've kept this group busy. So please join me in recognizing their contributions to our state. The expansion of I-70 has been talked about in this building for decades. Decades of hot air, decades of passing the buck. Under our administration and this General Assembly and the leadership of Lincoln Huff, decades of inaction has turned into action and this summer, construction on I-70 is set to begin in Columbia and from there, let's just say there is no turning back. <laughs> but it's the strategic way in how we chose to fund I-70 that I bring up the project today. With the smart use of our resources, and efficient and effective work, we're projecting a I-70 completion, not only on time, but with savings too. And two days ago, we received more great news from Congressman Graves that we will be receiving over $90 million in additional funds to put towards projects on I-70. With those savings and these additional funds today, we're announcing our recommendation to establish the I-44 Improvement Fund. This fund will build on the nearly $150 million already included in the current step. That's right, we aren't just laying the foundation to expand and improve one interstate across our state, but two interstates.
Now that all sounds good, but I have more. Today we are also ranked second in the United States for capital and bridge projects, ninth for improving rural roads, and 11th for the cost effectiveness and conditions of our roadways. Another important piece of infrastructure is broadband. Working with you, our administration has invested over $400 million towards broadband expansion, making tens of thousands of homes, business, and farm connections across the state. Thanks to these efforts, and now another $1.7 billion is coming to our state through federal funds that former Senator Blunt helped to secure, we believe that in the next five years, the digital divide in Missouri will be closed once and for all. In less than six years, We've accomplished more than most governors are able to in eight years. And I'll remind you, we did it all while challenged with some of the most unprecedented events in our state's history. Whether it was the duck boat crisis, floods, droughts, tornadoes, civil unrest, train derailments, or in 2020, when a global pandemic came knocking at our doors. A crisis that came with no roadmap or playbook. We never backed down or passed the buck. Oh, have there been critics? Sure. But critics are a dime a dozen. And one thing I have learned in life, you will never be criticized by someone doing more than you it's always be the person doing the less who makes the most noise. <laughs> Through all the criticism, we never stop working for the people of Missouri. And for all my like-minded colleagues who stood with me, fought alongside me, and who came here to be good public servants and put people first. I want you to listen closely to what I say next, because these are your wins too. Together, we have reshaped our Supreme Court and judiciary as a whole. We've protected the Second Amendment rights, focused on law and order, and safeguarded Missouri's landmark castle doctrine. We have fought the fight for life and reduced the number of abortions in our state from 8,000 annually to zero. We've streamlined state agencies, supported our team members, and reduced the size of state government. We built over 1,000 bridges, repaired 50% of our entire highway system, and crafted lasting partnerships. We've cut through nearly 20% of the regulations on the books and made state government more efficient and effective while unleashing an economic development. We've maintained our AAA credit rating and achieved the lowest unemployment ever recorded in our state's history. We've paid our bills. We've left the state of Missouri with 50% less debt than we started. We left $1.5 billion on the bottom line. We've created over 110,000 jobs and brought $14.5 billion in new business investments. We've cut taxes three times and reduced income tax burdens by over 20% with the largest income tax cut in our state's history. No one, I mean no one, has gone to bat for the people of Missouri like this administration and you, and today we have won. As I began to wrap up here, 
I want to recognize another group of special people who helped us make it all happen. These individuals are truly the best of the best. I couldn't have asked for better people to serve with in the office of governor and with six million Missourians across our state. They're often overlooked and overworked, but their impact on this state is beyond measure. We've taken on challenges that no one could ever imagine. They never complained, they never gave up, and above all, they believed. They believed in the mission. They believed in our people. And they believed in the extraordinary capabilities of Missourians to achieve an even better tomorrow. I'm filled with pride that we have public servants of such caliber serving our great state. As the sun begins to set on my public service career, I know their talents will continue benefiting Missourians today, tomorrow, and years to come. To the most loyal and hardworking people I have ever had the honor of working alongside, from the bottom of my heart and on the behalf of this entire state, I say thank you. With the members of my staff, both past and present, please stand to be recognized. As a final message to this body, I'm reminded of an old saying. A society grows great when old men and women plant trees, the shade of which they know they will never sit in. To summarize, it's all about putting people first. Ladies and gentlemen, that's been the focus of this administration. We've planted the seeds today for a better Missouri tomorrow. The First Lady and I may never be able to fully realize the work we've done here alongside of all of you. But that was never the purpose in the first place. The point is that all of our kids and our grandkids across the state will. With faith, family, and freedom at the forefront, honoring the Constitution, and leading with the ideas of the Declaration of Independence, putting people first, that's what leadership has been to us. In Missouri, our economy is strong. Our democracy is strong. Our people are strong. And we can keep it that way if we continue to put people first. <laughs> Missourians took a chance on me and place their confidence in me and my team to put the people of the state first. You gave me the largest victory margin of any Republican governor in modern history, and I will forever be grateful. When I got the call to become governor, my big brother told me, little brother, you come back home the same way you're leaving here today with your head held high. While I'll be keeping that promise, the First Lady and I will return to the farm with our heads held high. And if we are honored enough to be considered by Missourians as a pretty good governor, a decent guy, or someone who never forgot where he came from, then it will all be worth it. Words cannot express the sincere appreciation I have for this state and our people. So for one final time before this chamber today, I simply say to the more than six million Missourians who I've had the absolute privilege of serving, it has truly been the honor of my life to be your 57th governor of the great state of Missouri. God bless you, God bless Missouri, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you.